morning everyone. We do give you a very warm welcome uh, to our morning service and we also uh, welcome uh, those who will be uh, watching from home. Uh, no doubt with the feet up, having a drink of tea in a nice warm uh, home, uh, whereas we have braved uh, through the rain etc. haven't we? So anyway, I trust we're in for a great meeting this morning as it is our privilege uh, to be able to actually come uh, and meet together. As uh, no doubt you'll all know, every morning at 8.30 uh, will start of the day, uh, which is on the internet and can be accessed by using uh, YouTube. Now this Tuesday, anyone who's interested in singing as part of a group here in the church, uh, there'll be a short practice and then uh, they will be recording in the bleak midwinter. Very appropriate for this morning, isn't it, with the weather? And this will be used in the carol service. So if you're free on Tuesday, come along to the church, sing it through a few times, it'll be recorded for the candlelight carol service. Uh, we will meet next Sunday, as usual, at 10.30. Um, and then in the evening, don't forget, uh, it will be uh, the candlelight carol service, although we won't be meeting here in the church, you'll have to access it through uh, YouTube, Facebook, whatever ways. Uh, of course, you can access it now on the uh, church site. Um, now, with regard to uh, Tuesday, by the way, um, we'll be meeting, uh, sorry, Friday, we'll be meeting um, on the car park and we'll be singing carols. This is new, we've never done it before. Last year, as you know, went to the precinct. This year, we're using our church car park. And the idea is to sing carols, which will be recorded, and they will form part of the candlelight carol service uh, on next Sunday evening. So, so come if you can, uh, bring a torch, if it's raining, obviously, umbrella, whatever, but we're we'll recording it, and it will form quite a part uh, of the service. So uh, please, and anyone else, you know, just make a good gathering, and we will hopefully be able to uh, safe distance on the car park. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Pastor Will. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, great to uh, thank you for coming out on such a horrible morning. It doesn't look like it's got light yet. Look, it's still, it still looks dark outside. <laughs> looks like an evening service, doesn't it? Proper winter's day. Anyway, I hope it's a little bit warmer in here than it was last week. We've shut that door over there. So hopefully, we've had to open windows though because of the ventilation, but we've shut that door over there. So hopefully we'll be, you'll be okay. Um, but I did warn you to bring a blanket if you were gonna be a bit cold, didn't I? So uh, it's lovely to see you here anyway. And we're here because we're here to worship God. We're here to give him praise and thanks for all he's done for us, as we would do any Sunday. But of course this time of year, it's more poignant because it's Christmas, in case you hadn't noticed. And uh, you know, some of you might not have, I don't know. And uh, so we're gonna sing some Christmas carols this morning. We haven't sung many of them yet. Um, so these are ones that we will all know quite well, I think. Uh, and we've got some lovely choirs to help us sing them. Isn't that great? So, um, so I think on some of them anyway. Um, we're going to start off with, Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, come to Bethlehem. It's a call to worship the King. So remember the rules. We're not supposed to sing out loud, really. Just do it nice and quietly. And then um, we'll all be safe. That's what we want, isn't it, for Christmas and every other time too. So let's stand and let's uh, let's sing our first hymn together. <laughs> Thank you. 
of being so it's difficult, isn't it? Because these are carols we normally belt out in the middle of the street somewhere, and here we are, sat and having to kind of sing it really nice and quietly. So uh, there's no excuse next Saturday, next, fr next Saturday, uh, Friday night. Sorry, is it Friday night? We're going to be belting it out in the car park. Hopefully the weather will be good, and um, so we need to pray that the weather will be good so we can do that, record ourselves singing so that we can use it in our candlelit carol service online next Sunday. And just to, for, for the Tuesday night as well, just to add to that, um, yes, come along, we, we're gonna sing just one carol in here, which we'll do with the music and everything. But, uh, so hopefully then at half past seven, so that's seven o'clock to meet for singing, half past seven, um, we will then be meeting, uh, those who have got reading parts in the service um, as well, gonna be reading, uh, we've asked to do that. If you can do that and meet at half seven, so some of you might be singing as well, we'll come along and we'll record that then as well. So we're trying to record everything on Tuesday night if we can in here with this all set up with a stable and a manger and all kinds of stuff so it'll be great looking forward to that all ready for the following Sunday so that'll be good right let's pray shall we let's come before the Lord in prayer Janice is going to pray for us this morning so thank you Janice. let's pray <clears throat> Heavenly Father we thank you for every good gift you give to us thank you for watching over us this past week and bringing us back together again today. Thank you for protecting us and providing for us. Thank you for friends, family, and for all that we have. We thank you especially that at this Christmas time, we remember that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You, the mighty eternal God, became a man so that you could be our example and ultimately give your life for us. We give you praise for all these things. Thank you too that you invite us to bring our petitions to you, the God who is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. We especially pray for the leaders of our country at this difficult time. They face many challenging situations and we ask that you will give them wisdom and that we might be led along the path that is right in your sight. We think about the Christmas cards and leaflets which have gone into local homes this week and thank you for those who've distributed them. May the cards be a blessing to people. We pray that you will use the witness of our church in this community over the Christmas period and that many will tune in to watch our candlelight service. Bless our pastor as he prepares the word and may many understand just what Christmas is really about. We pray for those of our fellowship who live alone and those facing difficult situations. May they feel your presence and have the strength to cope with all they have to do each day. We pray for Claire as she's in hospital. May the doctors be able to help her and may the family know that she's in your hands. Bless Walter at home as well. We now commit our time together this morning to you. We do not need to ask that you'll be with us as you've already promised that. So we ask that each of us may feel your presence and be encouraged to serve you faithfully in the days ahead. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. We'll sing again now another carol. Uh, see amid, the, it's not quite snowing, but it's nearly there. <laughs> see amid the winter's snow born for us on earth below. Hail, uh, ever hail the happy morn when Jesus was born. And uh, ever the, the dawning of that new day when, as Janice just prayed, heaven came to earth, when God became a man, mm. when Jesus came uh, as a baby, as one of us. So it's a great carol of <laughs> celebration, isn't it? So we're going to stand up and we're going to sing that again.
during Christmas time, every Christmas, um, they, there are loads of little video things that come out online which are really good and um, I've been collecting them over the years because we use them in services and what have you. And uh, they're really good as like little evangelistic tools to put out there if, you've, if you're on social media, you can put them on your pages and stuff like that. And this one's called, I wanted to show you this one this morning. This one is called the Christmas Scale. So let's watch it together, shall we? Thanks, Claire. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then, one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight-note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said, I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses? She said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. And that's when I realized the good news she was talking about.
and upbeat. Now that's cheered you all up for a Sunday morning, hasn't it? I'm smiling now when you... Uh, that's, that's what we need. Okay, we're going to look at God's Word together in a moment, but before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, Ron if he'll come and read it to us. So Ron, you better come and read God's Word to us this morning. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning. We've got two Bible readings this morning, one from the Old Testament. I guess you can guess where it's from. And then the second one is from the New Testament. The first one is from um, Isaiah, and it's chapter 7, or chapter 9, reading from verse 7, uh, verse 2 to verse 7. I got that right, I hope. <laughs> right, and then we're going to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Right. Chapter, verse 2 of Isaiah 9. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee, according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulders, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be in the burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there should be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment, and with judgment from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And now we look in the New Testament, John chapter 1, reading from verse 1 down to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for the witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of God has been read to you this morning. God bless us all. So th those verses from Isaiah are a prophecy about um, Jesus coming, isn't it? A prophecy, a, mess a messianic prophecy, they call it, about the Messiah coming. And then they're fulfilled in Jesus. And we see that in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1 to 14, particularly verse 14, the verse we're looking at. And the, and the Word becomes flesh, or became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only 
begotten of the Father. And uh, we'll look next week, we've looked last week at the word that became flesh when we looked at the word being God's expression of himself, how God uh, reveals himself to the world. So he reveals himself in creation. There's the word of God in creation. He reveals himself through other people uh, these days as well. We, we are meant to be God's, God's word to the world as well and, and speak God's word to the world in the gospel. Uh, and he re but ultimately, he reveals himself most of all through Jesus, his son, because he comes... The, the, the people that God wanted to reveal himself to more than anything else, of course, was his creation, you and I, people. And so God came as a person to reveal himself to us. Um, so, yes, so he reveals himself to us in, his, uh, in all his glory. And we see all the glory of God in Jesus. And he fulfills all the promises that God made about the Messiah. And we've been looking at that in the mornings, if you've been following the thought for the days. Now, just a little plug for next week and the week after, we're changing it slightly. We're talking about the same title as this series, which is God's Greatest Gift. And we're looking at that over the next week and the week after leading up to Christmas uh, on the thought for the days. and um, Or thoughts for the day. That's probably the best way to say it, isn't it? And um, But it, it will have a quite, hopefully, an evangelistic touch to it. So if you've got people who you think you might want to... I know lots of people watch it anyway and you've invited people. If there's people you'd like to just mention and say, be worth watching it this next week and sending a link to them so that they could watch the thoughts for the day in the morning. Because we're talking about how people dealt with the greatest gift that God gave to us. You know, Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and their responses to all of that over the next few days. But for, the, for us this morning, how do we respond to God's greatest gift to us? The word becoming flesh, Jesus himself, God making himself real to us. That's what it was all about, wasn't it? God and man unite in one person. It's hard for us to understand. And I don't think we're meant to understand it really, because if we could, then probably we'd be God. And I don't know about you, but I'd make a terrible God. You wouldn't want me as God at all because I know how sinful my head is and my mind is and my heart is. But God is perfect and reveals himself in his son Jesus. He takes on our existence, all our existence. That's the wonder of Christmas. That's the message of it. We're going to look at that again this morning. And so today we'll look at the next part of that verse. The word becomes flesh, becomes real, takes on our humanity and lives made his dwelling, dwells among us. And that's the phrase we're looking at today. God's dwelling place. A dwelling is where we live, isn't it? You live in your dwelling, uh, wherever it might be. And we like to dwell in places, don't we? Uh, and, but the, the word that they, the, the, the Greek that's used in, that, in the passage here is, 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 is the word we get tabernacle from. And it means God came from heaven to earth to tabernacle with us. Now, tabernacle translates to living in a tent which is kind of how they all used to live in those days um, so interestingly God came to, from heaven to earth not to live in a palace but to live like ordinary folk ordinary poor people ordinary folk in the world in a tent as it was in those days so he comes and dwells in a tent tabernacles and the tabernacle also um, tabernacle also has the feeling of making your home there bedding down making a nest for yourself to live in so God came from heaven to earth and he dwelt amongst us. He made his home amongst us. He didn't just visit. And you know, like sometimes you go somewhere and you think, oh, I can't wait to get home. Can't wait to get back. Oh, it's nice, but it's nicer than your own home, isn't it? And uh, God, God came as his son Jesus into this world and completely made his home amongst us. Built relationships, put down roots. That's what we say, don't we? Put down roots somewhere. That Jesus was with us for 33 years or so. Uh, he put down roots. He lived like anyone else would, like a poor carpenter's son would live in those days. And so God became man. It's the reality of that. It's the, it's the amazing truth of this, there's this word again, this incarnation, Jesus, be God becoming man, as we'll see in a moment or two as well, a little bit more. We'll unpack it a little bit more. So God came to earth and walked and talked and felt and smelt and uh, pe had pain and sorrow and joy, tiredness, hunger, thirst, all the things that we feel naturally, God felt them through his son Jesus. Jesus was just like us in every way, in every way. Now just think about that. In all the ways that you are, Jesus was there. 
He was tempted in every way, the Bible says, like we are, except he didn't give in to it without sin. But apart from, because he showed us the way, he was the perfect, he was how we were made to be in the first place, without sin. Perfectly, Jesus often said to him, I've only come to obey the will of my Father, that's all God ever wanted us to do. But Jesus did it perfectly, the perfect man. But he felt and uh, everything that we feel and all the things that we said before, exactly as we are. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? And that's what Christmas tells us in the form of a baby. We'll look at that in a second. And, and it's uh, the second point really this morning. So that's God, that's what dwell means, to dwell, to live, to make a tent, to make a home, to be at home amongst us. If Jesus was here this morning, he would want to be your friend. I don't know how many friends you've got. But, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to think of Jesus who, want, who would want to come and sit next to you and have a chat with you and talk to you? It's not too irreverent to say that. Jesus was God himself in the flesh, but he knew how to be friends with people. You know that, don't you? Because who loved him more than the children? They all wanted to come and be with him. They sat on his knee. He taught them well. Kids loved being around Jesus. Now, kids don't like to be around miserable, horrible people or people who are too aloof and can't relate to them. Kids know straight away the sort of people who they like and they get alongside. So Jesus was like that. He was a friend of sinners. So Jesus was God becoming man and dwelling amongst us, really. But it's always been God's eternal desire. We're going to do a little recap of, of biblical history. God was always wanted, his purpose was always to dwell with mankind. That's why in creation, going right back to Genesis, chapter 3, God wanted to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. Can you imagine that lovely picture? You know, God comes out and, and uh, I don't know how this looks, you know, God as a person, well, we see that in Jesus, don't we? And God, it says, walked with Adam in the cool of the day. At the end of the day, they'd all been out doing whatever they were doing, and God comes and walks at them. Hey, Adam, how's it going today? Can you imagine that? How's it been? That's what. I, have a chat with us. Sit down and talk at the end of a day. The perfect day, because it's perfect. Can you imagine that? That's a little picture of heaven, isn't it? I, I, not floating on a cloud, because I'm not sure I'd want to float on a cloud. I, 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 I get, I'm not got any head for heights like that at all. I would be really, really sick if I floated on a cloud. Uh, but I'd love to spend an evening chatting and talking, if you like, with God. I'm not being irreverent. That's what it says. That's what God made us for. Because we were like, he made us to be like him, in his image. So that he could have a relationship with us. And what does relationship mean apart from that? Talking, chatting, being at home with one another. This is what God wanted to communicate to us through his son coming to earth. And so God's desire was to, to spend that time with us, walk with Adam and Eve. But that fateful day when he walked to meet them and he knew exactly what had happened, that's because for the first time they hid from him. And therefore he had to go after them. And God has always come after us since. Where are you? And God knew exactly where they were. And he knew exactly what they'd done. In fact, God always knew they would do that. Because in creation, in giving us the, the, the ability to love him, he also gave us the ability to choose not to love him. And we see the results of that in our world today. People choosing to reject God. So in creation, God's desire in creation was to build, to, to create a people for himself, to spend eternity with, to have that relationship in the cool of the day and all those things that we talked about with us. We broke it. We broke it. We choose to break it, don't we? And so then God tries to repair that relationship and, and through the prophets and through the Old Testament we read, and that this word, the tabernacle again, God gives them a building where they can meet with him. A portable building, they can take it round with them. And, and he gives them, in, Ex in Exodus chapter 25, and, and onwards, there you can read all the way through it, and all through Leviticus and various other ways in which they had to come to God and go through all these elaborate uh, sacrifices and, and, and uh, procedures, if you like. And the tabernacle, which was this portable tent, which was not like a tent you get nowadays, which just goes up in 10 minutes. Um, those, those tents we used to have with the frames. Do you remember them? With all the poles. Do you remember putting them up? And, and uh, they were colour-coded. And they, they meant to match, but they didn't. Uh, you know, you'd have like a bit left over every time, and it would be, uh, that's the aerial for the telly. That'll just do up there. It's kind of, you know, we would, it was always like that. We, we've always loved camping, but, you know, but if you went, you know, Really, we'd pray that God would help us if we ever turned up somewhere in a wet day and we had to put one of them things up because it would be soaked by the time he did it. Now, the tabernacle was even more complicated than that. 
God gave them instructions. Every single part of that tent that God built for them in the wilderness was one that he said, it, the, the, everything, every fabric, every bit of gold and silver and everything else, every wooden thing was all given by God's good design. They say, this is how I want it to be built. Build it like this. Because all these things say something about me. And the way you come into that temple through the sacrifices in the system, it's all about me. That's the reason why. See, the problem is you've rejected me and the only way you can approach me is through the shedding of blood. The wages of sin is death. The picture has always been there. So the picture of a tabernacle was great. God's presence with them. He dwelt in that. His cloud of his presence would come down. And the presence of God there was terrifying for many people. They wouldn't go in there. They'd find it really difficult to go in because of that. And the high priest could only go in once a year. Then God made it more permanent with the, temp the temple. In 2 Chronicles, David and then Solomon, they were the, 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 the plans and Solomon builds the temple. This wonderful edifice, which was the, one of the great wonders of the world, to reflect God's character, but again, built according to God's good design. And people approaching him according to his good design. Imperfect, because the only way they could approach him was through the shedding of blood again, sacrifice, and all these things. And then we see all of that then fulfilled in Christ. We're going to look at this again in a moment, but God's perfect communion with us. All this because God wanted to make a way that he could have relationship with us. It was so badly broken because of our rejection of him. We needed all this rigmarole to get back to him. And then Christ comes. That's a perfect kind of representation of the temple and God's presence on earth, as we've said. God becoming man. God relating to us, as we'll see in a second. Again, he comes to help us to, in order to bring back, us back to relationship with him. Except he doesn't come and prescribe sacrifices of other things. He is the sacrifice himself. And he gives himself so that we can, he opens up the way. The curtain of that temple is torn in two. There's no more barriers between us and God. We can come through Christ. What a wonderful provision for us. And now we have a relationship with God through who, the, the, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who Jesus has sent to us. God's unfolding story and plan we've been talking about in the Acts of the Apostles. And God's final dwelling, the purpose for all of us, and God's ultimate purpose in bringing Christ and in, in Christmas and in all the things that we've been talking about is that one day we will once again be reunited with him in eternal bliss, in eternal dwelling, just like it was in the garden. And we read about that in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new garden, a new everything, a new place for God's people to dwell for eternity. I saw all this. This is John saying this, isn't it? The first heaven, the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. It's a wonderful day. Okay. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, God himself saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people. No barriers, no bars anymore. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's what God's got planned for us. It's all part of his eternal plan. All of this is just because God wants to have a fellowship relationship with you. Isn't that amazing? The plan of the ages. You're part of that. Now the dwelling of God is with man and he makes it possible because God because uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and lived among us let's just be, uh, before we bring things to a close this morning look at this, in this we often use the word a Christmas and it's a Christmas word isn't it it isn't really it should be a word we use any time but it's a Christmas word Emmanuel God with us Emmanuel God with us with us. What does that actually mean? And I just wanted to unpack that word, those, those words, God with us, just for a few moments in our last few minutes together. Because that really is the message of Christmas, isn't it? He dwelt among us. God left heaven and came to earth. He became part of his 
creation, didn't he? And it's the truth of the message of Christmas. It's the Bible's central message. It's everywhere. God wants us to know that he's for us and he's with us and he hasn't left us on our own. Not just in our circumstances now, but that his plan is being fulfilled. So it does link quite well to what we've been talking about in, uh, in, the, in the book of Acts, doesn't it? His plan is being fulfilled. So God, let's look at that word, God with us. This is God, the almighty God. I think, Janice, you mentioned it in your prayer, didn't you? You talked about how amazing it is that God who created the heavens and earth would, would think about becoming as small as part of his creation as a human being. Taking on all our frailty. The God who never gets tired, who never feels pain, who never uh, struggles with suffering, who never has cries and has tears and all those things, becomes a man who has all of those things. Allows himself to feel what we feel. How do we know God became a man in Christ? People say that, don't they? How do you know that God was, Jesus was God's son? How do you know all about that? And I, I, heard, I read interesting things this week, a number of different things I was, I was kind of preparing for this. But it's interesting that God became a man and, and became a man as a Jewish man on earth, didn't he? And of all the religions in the world, the one religion, if you like, that could not believe that man could be anything like God, that he was something other than mankind, was the Jewish people at that time. All the other faiths have, are either pantheistic, they think God's in everything, or, or polytheistic, where they have lots of different gods, they're two more big words for you, you can forget them, but that's what it means, okay? So the, all the other religions in the world are like that. They're gods in all sorts of places. And you have a teacher who teaches them about this and you can almost worship anything you want. But here we have the other way around, the only faith that believes this, that God came to us. We don't go to him, but he came to us. And so he comes in, in the form of a Jewish carpenter's son. And yet those Jewish people, all one by one, different people, thousands of them, became believers in him. Now it would take a lot of convincing to give up all that they believed and been taught from thousands of years beforehand to actually start believing in this, that this fellow was not just a, 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 a champion, but he was God himself. He wasn't just a Messiah kind of champion, warrior, king, but he was God himself. And yet people were willing to believe that. What made them believe that? Everything about what Jesus said and did and, and how he walked on this earth was screaming the fact that he was God's son. And the only thing that made sense of who Jesus was and, was and the things that he said and the way that he lived and the way that he could prove it was if he was God's son. If he wasn't God's son, he'd be a kind of lunatic. He'd be some kind of idiot. Nobody would follow him. But it was the evidence when Jesus was walking the earth with all those people that we have before us is so compelling that millions of people have given up their lives for him through the centuries. The creator becomes his creature. There is no parallel anywhere else. It makes Christianity exclusive. Christmas makes Christianity exclusive in that sense. And it's irritating to a lot of people and actually offensive to a lot of people as well that we would say Jesus is the only way. That's what Jesus said. But if he is the one who's come from heaven, if he is God's son, then he is the only way. There is no other way. All other faiths say, uh, talk, teach about being good and moral and kind. And if we do enough of that, then our God or whatever it is that we worship will accept us in some way. But, Christ, but Christ tells us, Christianity, Christmas, the baby in the manger tells us that you can't get well in, good enough for God. You can't be, you, you're worse than you ever thought. You're completely, um, you're, compl you're completely out of favour with God and there's no way back. Nothing you can do will ever be good enough. No morality, no good works, nothing. And the babe in the manger tells us that we need him. We need a saviour. We can't do it ourselves. And that makes Christianity exclusive. Christmas tells us that we're terminally ill, if you like, and we need a saviour to make us well and brought back into relationship with God. It's, so that's God who comes with us and he comes and he needs to come with us and Jesus is God. But he comes, God, the second word in this is with us, isn't it? God with us. This great God comes alongside us. Sits next to us in our seat, if you like. He comes alongside because he wants to have an intimate relationship. 
There's a difference between experiencing God and having a relationship with him and being with him. God doesn't want us to just experience him. You know, you can go down the seaside and go watch roaring waves coming in and get a sense of the awesomeness of God. Look at the stars and you can see the awesomeness of his creation. You could stand on a mountain, all those things. You could sense, and, or you could be in a great Christian meeting and sense God's presence. But God wants more than that for us. He wants to be with us. Do you get the, the extent of that? And so God didn't come with some blazing thing. In the, in, in the Old Testament, when God visits people, we mentioned it before, it was terrifying. Fire and thunder and trumpet and darkness and wind and whirlwind. All these things are mentioned. And it, usually when God visited his people in the Old Testament before Jesus came, they didn't have to hit the deck. They were so scared. Terrifying, awesome presence of God. Moses, when he went up the mountain, was the closest he got to God. And he, he had to wear a veil over his face when he came down. And the reason is that, that be, because of our guilt, and, and naturally we feel guilty before a holy God, we can't stand before him. That's what the Bible says. And then God comes to us, in Christ, as a baby. There cannot be any more intimate relationship than a, 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 a parent with a baby child, isn't it? The baby is totally innocent. You pick the baby up and hold it and hug it and it's close. And that smell. I still remember our girls being able to hold them there and the head was there. I could smell it. Johnson's baby powder or whatever it is, isn't it? <laughs> the smell of every baby that's been born in the West anyway. You know, but it's, it's a smell, isn't it? And you never forget that, do you? You can smell it now. I bet if you've had children, you could smell it too. You know what it's like, the innocence and the, the warmth. And the total vulnerability and trust. That's what God did for us. No more frightening God. Because Jesus, the reason we, he did that was because Jesus has taken away the veil. He's taken away the barriers. He came to take away our sin and the thing that keeps us from God. And in Christ the baby in the manger is saying, I want to be with you. That kind of intimate relationship. I thought that was amazing when I read that this week. What a lovely thing to think about Christmas, the baby. That's why he's a babe in a manger. That's why he is the way he is. Fear God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness. So in other words, this great God who just spoke and the world came into being, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ, the little baby. That's what we have at Christmas. God with us at that intimate level. And us is the last word in that little trilogy, isn't it? Us. Us is a word that it's not everyone. It's not God with everyone. It's not God with all. It's not God with everybody. It's God with us. Who are the us in this statement? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? In the, in the, in the Christmas story, it's for the people who got invited, the shepherds and the kings, those who came to worship him. The people who came with no agenda. The people who felt that they were the outcasts. They didn't believe that. It's interesting in the story that the angels appear to shepherds. The outcasts of, every, of their society, the lowest of the low. This child has come for you. And in order for us to appreciate who Jesus is and to know that closeness, we have to come to him like a shepherd, if you like, who don't feel that we deserve any of it, who recognise that we're terminal, if you like, who recognise that we're wasters. We haven't got anything to offer God. We've got nothing to bring to him. So we cling to the baby and we see him and he comes for us. God with us those who are ready to commit themselves to him with no agenda. I haven't got anything in my hand. That's that old hymn we sing in it, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross. I cling. And that's why we come to Jesus. We don't come saying, I, somehow I deserve this. I've worked hard. I've done well. Somehow, you know, um, you know, you need to recognize some of the good things that I've done and feeling good about myself with some kind of pride. None of that affects at all. We get rid of all of that. When I survey the wondrous cross, it pours contempt on all my pride. It does. Because we just come to that baby in all his innocence. 
And we recognise that what Christ is, is come to want, has come to be one of us. And he's taken away the barrier. And we come in the same way as a little child, if you like, to Jesus in this way. It's a wonderful picture. So Jesus comes, the us are for those who don't believe that they are. It's interesting, in all the New Testament, the Pharisees and scribes and things constantly at Jesus about different things. And they think they're in. They think they're, they're the us. God with us. They think God's with them. But Jesus is forever saying to them, no, you're not. You're like the elder brother outside in the prodigal son story. The us are the prodigal sons who come back and return and say they've got nothing. That's the us. I wonder if you're in the us this morning. So let's just apply this as we close very briefly. Is the word made flesh means the word becomes real. All this becomes real and changes the way I behave. Am I following Christ's example in that way? Letting God work through me. The incarnate word of God. God's desire was always to make a home in, with us. So do we know him? Do you know him this morning? Intimately. The difference between experiencing him and knowing him. You can experience it. It's like going to a concert and you've, you have a favourite singer or something. You go and you experience it. It's wonderful. And you think, yeah, I, I, I love that person. It's great. The difference between that and then going afterwards backstage and having a cup of tea with them or whatever. And being a friend to them. God wants us to be that friend. God wants us to be that person who is intimate with him when no one else is looking. Every day. All the time. Is that you? And if, if you're not feeling that and you don't know that this morning, that's what Christmas offers us. That's what the word becomes flesh means to us. Then what do we need to do? Perhaps we're coming and we're not part of the us because we've actually come with a lot of agendas and a lot of thoughts. God has to do things my way. And then I'll feel like I can belong to him. God wants much more for you than that. But you have to give up your agenda. You have to give up your thoughts. And you have to come like a shepherd who doesn't believe he's worth it. Is that you this morning? What a challenge for us. God with us, Emmanuel. Got a video to play just before we sing our last carol. I'll ask you if, um, Gwen if you get it ready for us. This is Spurgeon. So, you know, you've heard me, but now you've got the classic Spurgeon who's going to talk about briefly what God with us means. Oh, may God teach you the meaning of that name, Emmanuel. God with us. Emmanuel. It is wisdom's mystery. God with us. Sages look at it and wonder. Angels desire to see it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depths. The eagle wings of science cannot fly so high and the piercing eye of the vulture of research cannot see it. God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word God with us and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us 
Thomas is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us. God with us. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the babe in the manger. We thank you for that intimate relationship that you want from us and with us, that you created us for. We thank you for what Christmas means, that you've come to take away the veil of sin and you've brought us into your presence. Help us, Lord, to come, Lord, with nothing in our hands again and worship you this morning and give you thanks for all that you've done for us and this wonderful truth that God is with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final carol this morning, and uh, we're going to sing about uh, how this happened. Once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed, and he came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. Let's stand and sing this, shall we, to finish with.
poverty. 